This is a short video about some information that we need to lead into L'Hopital's rule, um, a nice way to evaluate limits of uh, indeterminate forms. So speaking of that, so what's kind of our setting for right now? Suppose you've got two functions f and g. And let's say that the limit as x approaches some number c of both of my functions f and g is zero. So what we're interested in is what can we say about the limit of the quotient f over g? So if you notice, right, like if uh, both of these go to zero, well then this is an indeterminate form zero over zero. And what is this indeterminate form? What's that mean? So what does that mean? Well, that says that this limit here, it might not exist, or it could be a real number. I don't know. And that's what we mean by indeterminate. I can't tell. I can't tell just by looking at it. And sure enough, for different functions f and g, there will be times that the limit won't exist. Or for some other functions f and g, where they both go to zero, maybe you do end up getting a number. So there's no one rule that tells me how these things always behave. I'll have to kind of um, treat them on maybe what seems like a case-by-case -case basis. And the point of this video is to tell you about L'Hopital's rule, which is a way to try to treat this. So an indeterminate form, it doesn't follow our usual limit laws. So up to what we have right now with like, um, you know, could I take the limit of the top and the bottom? Well, that gives me zero over zero, which I don't know what that means. That's not a symbol um, that we're used to messing with. So like the symbol zero over zero doesn't follow the usual algebra rules that you'd like to have happen. Like those don't cancel. So that's what I mean by it doesn't follow the usual limit laws. And maybe I should also say it doesn't follow usual uh, laws of algebra. So what do we do? So again, what we're going to do is we're going to build into this, this thing, this theorem called L'Hopital's rule to help us compute these. So what's some of the background information that we need to know? So the first thing that we need to know, if I've got two functions f and g that are defined on some closed interval, and I'm going to let f of a and f of, and g of a both be zero. So let's say f and g are both zero at this left endpoint. And I'm also going to assume that uh, g of x itself is non-zero as long as my x's are between a and b is what this says here. So if I finally assume that f and g are both differentiable uh, at the point a, again, the left end point of this interval here, and if I also assume that the derivative of g at a, in other words, uh, well, and I should say it that way, uh, g prime of a is not zero, then what can I say? The limit of f over g as x approaches a, just from the right, since my x values are to the right of a in this little interval, that should be equal to f prime of a over g prime of a. That's kind of interesting. So how do we prove such a thing? So what we're going to do is we're going to play around with just this fraction f of x over g of x. And I claim that that's equal to f of x minus f of a over g of x minus g of a. And how come? Well, what did we assume? I assume that both f and g were zero at this point a that I care about. What do I mean that I care about? Well, this is the point that we're going to let x get close to in the limit. So again, I can rewrite this fraction. I'm just subtracting zero in the top and bottom. So nothing's different. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the numerator by x minus a, and I'm also going to divide the denominator by x minus a, so that this stuff is the same as this stuff, right? I've just divided the numerator and denominator by x minus a. And why on earth would I do that? Well, because I want to try to bring some information about the derivative in place, and now I see I've got the difference quotient for f, and I've got this difference quotient for, for g. And so what are we going to do? We're going to take the limit of both sides. The limit of this side should be equal to the limit of this side, and so if I write that out, I can take the limit of the top because it exists as f prime of a, right? This limit up here is f prime of a. Similarly, this limit down here is g prime of a. And I know that I could say that because I assume that f and g are differentiable. Therefore, I can take for granted that those limits exist and that they should be f and g prime of a respectively. Therefore, what do I get? I get the result. The limit of f over g as x approaches a from the right in this case is f prime over g prime. Okay, so the next thing that I need to know is what's called the Cauchy mean value theorem. And let me just say what it is. I'll read it to you. So if I've got two functions f and g that are continuous on this closed interval from a to b, and it's differentiable on this open interval from a to b, and suppose that g prime is never zero as long as x is between a and b, then there should exist some point c between a and b such that the following holds. f of b minus f of a divided by g of b minus g of a should be equal to f prime of c over g prime of c. And uh, the Cauchy mean value theorem is actually a generalization of the um, usual mean value theorem in the case that what if g of x is the function x? Well, then in that case, this would be b minus a and uh, g prime in that case would just be one, right? So then what do I get? I get f of b minus f of a 
over b minus a equals f prime of c. As soon as I move this to the other side, I get the usual mean value theorem. So uh, Cauchy's mean value theorem is just a little bit more general. It holds for, say, two functions, right? So the regular mean value theorem is just a specific case of the Cauchy mean value theorem. Um, Cauchy mean value theorem is also useful for um, trying to determine the mean value theorem for, say, parametric equations, but we won't get too far into that. Um, not in this video anyway. Okay, so how do we prove such a thing here? Oh, I guess I gotta erase all that good stuff, huh? I pushed the wrong buttons. Okay, so bear with me while we continue to erase. Um, almost there, and then we'll get to the proof. All right, woo. So what did I assume? I got to assume that uh, g prime is never zero as long as x is between a and b. So then what else do I know? Well, that guarantees that g of a can't be g of b, right? g can't have the same value at the endpoints of this interval here. If you think about why is that true? Well, what does Rolle's theorem say? Rolle's theorem told me that uh, otherwise, what if g of a did equal g of b? Then Rolle's theorem guaranteed that there's some x between a and b where the derivative equals zero. But wait a minute, that contradicts the derivative's not zero. So Rolle's theorem guarantees, in this case, since the derivative is non-zero, then the endpoints, the value at the endpoints can't be zero. All right, so what we're gonna do is, similar to how we proved the mean value theorem, where we got tricky and defined a function that makes all this good stuff work, we're gonna do the same kind of thing here. I'm gonna define this function h that is the following. It's this constant, f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a. A lot of letters going on here, just keep track of x as the variable, right? So this is just some constant times g of x minus g of a. So again, g of a is some, some constant, but here is where I'd like, you know, plug a number into, say. And then similarly, minus, here is where I'd plug something in for x, but then minus this constant here. And so why on earth are we playing with this function h? Well, let's think about it so far. I got to assume lots of good properties about f and g as far as continuity and differentiability go. And what is this? These are just um, some kind of combinations of those functions f and g. Therefore, I should have that h also should satisfy these same hypotheses of being continuous and differentiable. So that uh, in particular, what else do I notice? Why, why else did we pick this function h this way? Notice when you plug in a for x, when you plug in a, this would be zero and this would be zero. So h of a is zero. And then you guessed it, when you plug in b for x, when you plug in b, this would be what? g of b minus g of a, which would cancel with this denominator. And here you get minus f of b minus f of a. Well, if there's no denominator there on the left, I hope you see that the terms with the f's are gonna cancel. So then in fact, you get h of b is zero. So what have I got? I've got a nice continuous function on a, b that's differentiable on the open interval a, b that is zero at its endpoints, it satisfies Rolle's theorem. So by Rolle's theorem, there should exist some point where the derivative of this function h is equal to zero. The next thing we wanna do is look at this formula for this function h. Remember, x is the variable, so what's the derivative of h look like? In other words, what is h prime? Well, it would be this constant times the derivative of this stuff, right, your constant multiple rule, and this just becomes, the derivative of this is just gonna be g prime, right? Since g of a is constant, it turns into zero. Similarly over here, this turns into f prime, and then this would go away. So if you plug c in, all that happens is you get this good stuff times g of c, uh, g prime of c, sorry, minus f prime of c when you differentiate. And so that is this formula right here. And what did we assume? We assume that h prime, which I'm telling you is this, is equal to zero. So finally, what should you do? You should add this to the other side and then divide by g prime of c and you get the result. So that is the proof of the Cauchy mean value theorem. And in the next video, we will start with the first form of L'Hopital's rule to help us determine a limit of an indeterminate form zero over zero.